From the Center for Agricultural Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, this is Nebraska Farmcast, and I'm Ryan Evans. There are many strategies that cow-calf producers can explore to be more profitable, and on this episode, we'll hear some examples based on data from the University of Minnesota's FinBin Livestock Analysis Tool. Randy Sainer is a livestock systems extension educator here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and he takes a dive into the data for a new article up on our website at cap.unl.edu. He'll share some practices that can help lead to higher gross margins, the strategic moves involving calf transfers to other enterprises, and the role that government payments can play in bolstering farm and ranch income. Hi, Randy. Thanks for joining me. Good to be with you, Brian. So in your new article, um, you break down, and wondering if you can do that here, break down some of the key factors that contributed to the top 20% of cow-calf producers that you looked at achieving a higher gross margin, which came out to uh, uh, $1,183 per cow. That was opposed to about $960 in the lower profit group. Yeah, so, so the high profitability group did some unique things. Um, they sold some calves at a higher price per pound, but also some of them were transferred to like either a background or feedlot. So they got some money in early and then they 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 transferred them out to a different enterprise and those calves brought in later. Um, so when they when those calves left, they were priced at market price when they're transferred out of the enterprise um, using using their value. Uh, they were also paid like $20.63 $20. per cow for government payments. Um, and they also had some call sales, but the, the, the call sales were actually lower than the than the high pro- the low profitability group because they didn't call as many animals. So um, those are things that probably help. You know, that government payment of $20, that added quite a bit of re- uh, income to them too. And I think people forget about that, that, you know, government programs can be make you more competitive or be beneficial for you, especially in times of drought or, or things like that. Yeah. And your analysis indicates that the more profitable group also engaged in transferring some calves to other enterprises such as stocker or feedlot programs. So how does this strategy enhance profitability in contrast to just selling off calves? Well, the one thing they can do is they can spread out risk for their operation. Um, so they're, all their eggs are not in one basket. Uh, but selling some ca- some of the calves get some income early, so you can pay some of your bills, while the other calves will get income later in the year. And so basically what they're doing is it's, a, it's just a management to spread out risk type strategy. Um, but again, um, they were valued at market price, the same price as our calves sold for. So... Um, that that does help a little bit with that that gross margin, you know, um, yeah. depending on where they value them at, um, could, could make a difference. And if we could go back to government payments, uh, which you indicated definitely seem to play a role in profitability, could you discuss how the high profitability herds manage to secure more government payments, and then uh, just how significant this is in their overall profit margin? Yeah, so, so the high profit group participated in probably more government programs, uh, which could which could be drought payments, it could be cover crops, be grazing management program, a CSP program um, participation. By doing this, it gave them a kind of a competitive advantage over the other low profitability groups. And the low profitability groups, if I remember right, was like eight something. So so it was, it was significantly more. Now, you know, depending on where you're located, it could be any of those things I mentioned as far as government payments. And with the high profitability herds uh, spending significantly less on total expenses, yet uh, still managing higher weaning weights, uh, what management practices do you think are critical in achieving efficiency like that? So, so part of the we, high, higher weaning weight was due to the fact that they had less calf loss at open cows, which increased the weight per cow because you got to account for those open cows, which a lot of people don't do. Um, because the cow that lost their calves or are open still have expenses, right? They still, you still got to feed them. So the other cows have to pick up those expenses. So that's one reason why they had a heavier weight. Um, 
and that you know they got to put that weight onto other cows if they're open. So the low profitability groups had more open cows or more death loss. Um, and then um, you know the weaning weight could have been a little that was per cow. And if you look at weaning weight, that could also have something to do with um, um, just just how their nutritional program is. But most of it, I think, was the reproduction in the herd. That's the big difference. They had less open cows and less death loss, so they were to sell more calves. And the feeding strategy also appeared to be quite different between the high and low profitability groups, especially when it came to using alfalfa and uh, the overall reduction in feed costs. So how can producers balance nutritional needs of the animals with cost-effective feed purchases and if you can also talk about the role that forage testing plays in this, that would be great. So the high profit profitability herds brought or paid more for alfalfa hay. They had a higher higher amount of alfalfa hay they bought. Um, they can use the alfalfa to supplement protein to their cows along with hay, which would reduce the amount of supplemental feed they had to buy. So we have lower feed costs there. Um, and of course, alfalfa is your protein source uh, that that they needed to purchase. So instead of buying a bunch of distillers cubes, they used alfalfa with a little bit of feed supplement to, to get them there, which reduced their overall feed cost. And my theory probably with those high profitability groups was they probably tested their hay. So they knew exactly what they needed. Because if you know you can you can feed more protein, which costs you more or more energy than what they need, and it just puts fat on the cow. Um, we want cows that are in good condition, but we want to feed them for what their needs are. And we don't want to underfeed them either, because if you underfeed them, there's reproductive effects. And that could be part of what the lower group, profitability group had. They had more open cows, which could come back to their nutrition program. And by using alfalfa, it just cuts down on some of their costs of having to buy supplemental protein. Yeah, and we want to remind listeners to uh, take a read to Randy's new article up on our website at the Center for Ag Profitability. That's cap.unl.edu. We'll link to it in the description to this podcast as well. Randy Sainer is a livestock systems extension educator with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Thanks so much for the great info, Randy. Thank you, Ryan. You feel, feel free to contact me too at any time So about this article. Perfect. Yep. And you can find that on the uh, article as well, Randy's contact information. Thanks again, Randy. Thanks, Ryan. Nebraska Farmcast is a production of the Center for Agricultural Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. For the latest research-based information and education resources to manage your farm or ranch operation, visit our website at cap.unl.edu. That's cap.unl.edu.